Good afternoon to all, but also good morning and good evening to many of us. It's our pleasure to welcome you to the ITM alumni webinar towards coaching independent researchers celebrating women in science. Celebrating International Women's Day, this ITM alumni webinar puts in the spotlight the research conducted by ITM alumna Dr. Elizabeth Tabita Abu and her journey as a woman in science. The main aim of the ITM alumni webinars is to share research findings, expertise, and experiences on a specific international uh, tropical medicine and health topic within the ITM community of alumni, students, staff, partner institutions, and the wider global health community. I will now briefly explain some uh, webinar practicalities. If you want to ask a question, you can use the Q&A option you will have below your screen. You can ask a question anonymously if you would choose to do so. The chat is being disabled for questions, so please harmonize them all in the Q&A option. Questions will be moderated and only a select number of questions can be answered in live, given the limited time. Unanswered questions cannot be answered individually afterwards, for which we apologize. You can, however, use the forum function in the online alumni platform to start a discussion on your questions left after this webinar. At the end of the webinar, a short survey will be displayed and a browser window will open to give your feedback. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available afterwards on the ITM alumni platform and YouTube channel. I will now give the floor to Anne Verlinde. Anne joined in 2007 ITM, where she is leading the research office with main tasks in research policy, research grants, supporting and facilitating ITM's PhD training program. She is also taking a leading role in ITM's working group on gender and diversity. Anne, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you, uh, Charlotte, uh, for uh, uh, the introduction, for the opportunity, and for giving the floor today for once to an all-female uh, panel to celebrate the International uh, Women's uh, Day. And the theme of the International Women's Day 2022 is Break the Bias. And as people united, we should indeed strive for a world free of bias, stereotypes, and discrimination, a world that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. And with the ITM Working Group on Gender and Diversity, we are currently finalizing a policy and action plan in this regard. And we strongly believe that talented people must get equal chances and may not be hindered by any barriers related to gender, culture, or social background. And so today, it's, it's really a pleasure uh, to have uh, Elizabeth Tabitha Ebbio with us uh, and who recently won a PhD award in the ITM Individual PhD Scholarship Competition for Alumni, which is supported by the Director General of Development Cooperation and Humanitarian Aid. I pass the floor now to uh, Professor Lutze Lene, um, who is uh, the ITM supervisor of uh, uh, Tabitha and uh, also head of the unit uh, of uh, HIV and uh, TB. Lutz, please. Thank you, Anne. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Avita. Um, I first met her in 2019 as a student in our short course on tropical medicine and clinical decision making, and that was uh, the first time we, we interacted. She made herself very well noticed uh, by sharp questions, lively discussions. And in 2020, she became a student of our master program the Masters in Tropical Medicine uh, with the Clinical Science track. She was chosen by her fellow students as the class representative, and I think rightfully so, because she vowed that not one student in her class should fail, and she would do everything in her power to bring them all to the graduation ceremony, and she succeeded. She was also elected to represent the ITM alumni in ITM's General Council from 22 to 26. So an important, if you have uh, recommendations for uh, ITM, please uh, let, uh, let uh, Tabitha know. I became involved in her path as a woman of science uh, when she sent me a proposal for a fellowship for the West African Infectious Disease Society. And it was on a topic 
that uh, also recently caught my interest, namely non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And she will tell herself more about that. And of course, her story does not start at ITM. Her story has, has begun long before that. And so I leave it up to Tabitha to share her story. So Tabitha, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So I share my screen for the presentation. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone who is joining us from all over the world. I am privileged, really privileged to be given this opportunity to present my personal and research journey to this point and how my PhD track is progressing. My name is Elizabeth Tabitha Abiel and I am the speaker for this alumni webinar. There's the outline for my presentation. We will go through my personal life so that you know me a bit, just a little bit. And then we will end with uh, appreciating some people who have been of great help to me in my journey. It's always a difficult thing to talk about oneself. So when they give you a paper and say, write about myself, what are you going to say? I am the fifth of eight children and the first person in my family to attend high school. So in Ghana, you have basic school level and then you have high school, then college and the university. And before me, no one in my family had entered high school. And I had that opportunity because I took part in and won the basic level um, competition in science, technology, and mathematics education clinic for girls in Ghana. And this was after my headmaster, Master Kenya of Blessed Memory, um, approached me and said I should represent my school. So if Master Kenya hadn't been there, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. So I can say that I am a product of STEM, which is science, technology, and mathematics education. From 2005 to 2011, I had my medical education at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, obtaining my BSc in Human Biology and MBCHB, and MBCHB is the equivalent of the MD degree in Europe. And I did my residency in internal medicine and obtained my specialization with both the Ghana College and West Africa Colleges of Physicians in 2018. And so far you can see that I can be a little, a little bit adventurous. So in 2019, I came to Belgium. So I went to Belgium and did a research fellowship with Janssen Pharmaceutica, so their GPH infectious diseases. And within that time, 2020 to 2021, had my master's in tropical medicine with the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, where I met Prof. Lute and all the other wonderful people um, in ITM. And from the beginning of the year, I have been a PhD student, or I've started my PhD track with ITM. On the whole, I can say that I am a combination of different things. I am a mother, I am a teacher. So this is what this is on one of my awards in the, in the hospital at Cape Coast Teaching Hospital in Ghana. I'm a doctor, I am a patient advocate and I like to travel quite a bit. How about my research journey? That has also been one with ups and downs. I started with taking part in data collection on femur fractures at the Confanoti Teaching Hospital Orthopedic Department when I was an intern, and in Ghana we call us house officer, in 2011-2012. And in, from 2013 to 2015, as a medical officer, 
my first mentor was Professor Yao Asantiaoku, who recruited me into his research team, so the clinical research team, where we took part in the collection of the etiology of hepatocellular carcinoma in Sub-Saharan Africa, a paper which was later published in Lancet, Gastroenterology and Hepatology in, 29, in 2017. During that period, we also published some case reports. And as my interest in infectious diseases grew and getting to know what I wanted to do, I joined Professor Dokasobria Bua's research team as her mentee. And I think I can call myself as the first mentee of Prof. Obria Bua. During that period, we did some work on hepatitis B, HIV, and also published some case reports with colleagues. At Janssen Pharma, when I joined one of their clinical research teams, so their research and development team, I was given the opportunity to serve as the study responsible physician for five phase one clinical trials. Two that were successfully closed after writing the clinical study reports, one of which I used for my master's thesis, which I will talk about in the next slide. And from the beginning of the year, as I said, I started my PhD track. So my master's thesis was on the safety and pharmacokinetics, and I must apologize for those who are not so conversant with things on pharmacokinetics of so PK, RSV, and clinical trials that um, my master's topic was on the safety and pharmacokinetics of RSV antiviral investigation of small molecule, JNJ53718278, which was administered as a single dose to participants with various degrees of hepatic impairment in an open label phase one study. So I presented the interim analysis. The study is still ongoing and will be published once completed. And on to the meat of the matter. My PhD project will be on non tuberculous mycobacterial pulmonary disease. Again, it's a mouthful. And TB and TM, NTM co infection. And we'll look at the epidemiology, diagnosis, and management at a tertiary health facility in Ghana. My supervisors are so as as she was introduced, Prof. Ruth Lining, Prof. Len Regout from the University of Antwerp and ITM, and Prof. Dr. Sobria Bua from my home institution. As most of us know, or um, some of us are not aware, NTMPD, so I will use that as a short form for non tuberculous mycobacterial pulmonary disease. It is a chronic lung condition that presents just like tuberculosis. And it has various risk factors. So risk factors include people with bronchiectasis, those with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, people with cystic fibrosis, and in our setting, those with previous, who have been previously treated for tuberculosis and HIV positive individuals. Now, unlike TB, which is caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex and M. africanum in our setting, NTMPD can be caused by various N um, NTM, so non tuberculous mycobacteria, which are generally classified as environmental mycobacteria. So the common causes include Mycobacterium avium complex, which you call MAC, Mycobacterium cansasi, Xenopi, and abscesses. Now, why this? Why do we, why are we doing this with NTMPD and the co-infection? Now, when we compare TB and NTM, TB is a reportable or notifiable disease like we know. And we have data for the annual incidence rate in almost all regions in the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is the last um, treatment success rate from the Global TB report. However, when we come to NTMPD, 
the annual incidence rate is, is not well characterized, but you can see that the numbers are much lower. In Sub-Saharan Africa, what we have is a systematic review by Prof. Oko um, uh, in, 20, in 2017 that presents the prevalence of NTM from pulmonary samples. And note, pulmonary samples is not equal to NTMPD. So really, we do not know the disease states or the disease characterization of NTMPD in Sub-Saharan Africa. But if we compare the treatment duration for tuberculosis and NTMPD, even with drug-resistant TB, if you are going to take a long treatment duration, it is up to 24 months. And with the new treatments that are available, so for bedaculine and being available, pitomanate being available, the treatment can be brought down to 12 months. Same cannot be said for NTMPD. The shortest period that you can treat somebody who has NTMPD is when the person has M. Pansatis. And that means you should know the subspecies that is infected the person, and that is 12 months. For all the others, treatment is completed at least 12 months after culture conversion. Now, we all know all the challenges we have in Sub Saharan Africa. The, lack of or we don't have widespread use of cultures and um, midget cultures line probe assay so it is very difficult to diagnose ntmpd in a person who is presenting just like having tuberculosis and as i have already mentioned previous tb is a risk factor for ntm isolation and NTMPD in Sub-Saharan Africa. Also, there is increasing reports of patients who are being retreated for TB when they present with smear positive but expect negative. Many, many case reports, many cases are being reported from all over the world, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so it is important to ascertain if the presence of NTM in patients with TB will warrant TB treatment modification because there is no guidance on this. And then we will also need to collect data on the disease entity of NTMPD and its management in our setting. And that forms the rationale basically for this study. So our research questions include, what is the prevalence of NTM isolate and NTMPD in presumed TB patients? What species predominate when we look at colonization versus disease? Because I mentioned that NTM is basically environmental microbacteria. So is it, if, if you find it, is it really causing disease or not? What are the treatment outcomes? for both um, co-infection in drug-resistant TB and drug-sensitive TB? And what are the prevalence and predictors of NTM isolation among patients? The study would, will be taking place in various stages. So we will start with a scoping review that will look at the existing knowledge gaps on NTMPD in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we will characterize all the, the literature that exists and identify the gaps in the scoping review form. Then a second study, which will look at the retrospective analysis of existing laboratory data, which will include data from all referral hospitals in Ghana, or most of them, and thus we will estimate the prevalence of NTM in pulmonary samples. And this is important because we need to know what, is, what exists before we can add on. Then we will do a retrospective cohort study on rifampicin resistant and MDRTB patients who have culture done and see if the treatment outcomes with and without NTM isolation is different. And then the bigger part of the study, which is the prospective cohort study, 
which will look at the prevalence of NTMPD among presumed TB patients and then co-infection among presumed PD and TB patients, and then look at their management path and try and characterize and try to learn about the disease state and, and management outcomes, as well as management decisions. So this slide shows a picture of the software we are using for the scoping review. So it's called Rayan and a disclaimer, I am not promoting anyone's business, but it is a web-based software that you can employ when you are doing a systematic review or a scoping review. It helps you to co collaborate with somebody. So you put all your studies there, you, you can blind. So here you see that blinding is on when I'm doing my, my um, study identification or abstract review, the other person cannot see what I'm doing. And here we have finished um, abstract selection. So you can see the number of papers or the percentage of papers that we have excluded. So the number of articles that were imported, the excluded articles, maybe articles, included articles, and then ones that we have a conflict on. And so we are going to uh, meet and see if we can come to an agreement. But we are also in the process of submitting the protocol for this scoping review for publication. And how is this going to help us? Like I said, this is going to help us identify the gaps in NTNPD in Sub-Saharan Africa and help us shape the research questions that I mentioned before going forward in the PhD research. Now, what will be the impact of this study? The outcome data of NTMPD from this research will help us assess the current treatment guidelines and guide potential changes in the treatment strategy. Also, if co-infection is noted, will it affect TB outcome? And do we need um, treatment modification, which we will prefer or attempt to do? Ultimately, we hope to be able to propose an algorithm for the management of NTMPD and co-infection in Sub-Saharan Africa based on common clinical and radiological presentation and isolated species. Now for every research, there are challenges, there are limitations, and so we are not oblivious of that fact. For the retrospective study, we know that the, the main challenge will be from missing data in the prospective parts because of the long treatment duration and treatment decision or management decision, there will be lots to follow up, but we are mapping up strategies to be able to curtail these, as well as challenges in recruitment. Now, just to finish up in the last few slides, there are challenges that everybody faces, right? becoming a researcher in any setting. But in a resource limited setting, what are some of the challenges that we face, especially as a woman? I would say coaching and mentorship, finding the right mentor, finding the right coach with aligned interests, the right coach who will not just in code to use you, but mentor you so that you know the right path to take. The balance between clinical work and research, because I still believe that clinical questions must be answered by clinicians. And for, for us to be able to do that, we must be equipped to undertake clinical research. The next is collaboration. How do we collaborate with people outside of our comfort zone? Even the skills on scientific writing, these are things that are not really pushed in medical school. Scientific writing, proposal writing, writing grants, even small grants, looking for opportunities. Sometimes some opportunities come clouded, right? You cannot tell if this is an opportunity. And with the right mentor, with the right coaching, you can 
identify certain opportunities that may exist. And in our setting, one of the biggest issues as women is the decision to start a family, when to start, the support. It is really a challenge that we face. So because of that, after my PhD, even now, I am dedicated to mentor, so provide support to my junior colleagues, whichever way they want to take their, their, their tracks, even if they want to be businessmen, that is fine. They just, people just need to talk to somebody. Start a clinical research team, teach and impact knowledge into the next generation. And not forgetting being a mom, because I think it is still my best work yet. On this slide, I want to take the opportunity to thank the following individuals whom I call introducers. So on my left lower corner is Prof. Yawasanti Oku. My, right my left upper corner is Prof. Dr. Sobi Yobwa. I thank you all, Maria, for introducing me to Lutz. Lutz for accepting me. Derek for believing in me when you found me in, in Ghana and encouraged me to apply for the research fellowship and not forgetting all the millions and millions of people. I mean, remember if my headmaster hadn't given me that opportunity to enter into the STEM program, I would not have been able to enter high school and even go on to the university. So for all who bought food for me, who bought clothes for me, to help me stay in school and be here, I say thank you. In conclusion, it's not an easy road, but it is doable. And remember that you may have to take certain tough decisions along the way. Everyone needs somebody to show them the way, so don't be bothered to ask. Also women from all over the world, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, must be given equal opportunity, especially when they have identified talents. And for my PhD research, it signifies the importance of building clinical researchers to attend to answer important clinical questions. And with this, I say happy International Women's Day to all women on this platform. And thank you to all the men who support us to get to where we are. Thank you. So thank, thank you very much, Tabita. You go ahead, Anne. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tabita, indeed. Uh, it was a very nice uh, presentation. And also, thank you to share your personal uh, history of uh, in, in, into science. So I, I would like to kick off with, uh, with uh, uh, one uh, question. And of course, all people uh, are invited uh, uh, to uh, put their questions uh, in, uh, in the Q&A, of course. Um, what message, and you already touched upon uh, in, in your presentation, but um, more concretely, what message of support uh, you would like to give to, to young people who want to pursue a, a career in science, and more specifically to, to young, uh, to young uh, women and, and even young girls? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for the question. My first word is, um, you have chosen a noble thing, so keep at it. There will be challenges, but some people have done it, so you will be able to do it too. The second one is find a mentor. People have been where you are, so there is no point to repeat the same mistakes that people have done. So if you can get a short path to get into where you are, please use it. Talk to people, don't be afraid. Listen to their experiences, listen to their journey and learn from their experiences, whether it is good or bad. The next is bid your time. Things just don't happen at once. For every star, there is always a period of, of, of being in the wilderness. 
a period of learning and you must be committed to be or to have that period for learning. And lastly, don't hesitate to seek advice and help on your research journey. Thank you. Thank you, Zabita. There's, there was one question in, in, in the Q&A who relates uh, to the question I, I, I just uh, asked, but um, more specifically, do you also have uh, some suggestions on, on how to find a good balance between family and, and, and career? Is that something you can something to say on that as well? And, and thanks to the one who asked the question. Work-life balance is always um, a challenge, especially when you are a mother, when you are a daughter, it's, it's a challenge. But one is to have, have the support system. It can be your family, it can be friends, so have the support system. Plan your life. So what I do is to, to plan. There are certain things that you may want to do now that may not be the right time. And it will only come when you speak to people and when you take advice. Also, find time or put time aside to be with your family, especially if you have children. These days, there are, um, there are phones, there is internet. When I was in Belgium for two years, what I was doing was to call my kids. And so I call them every evening. I talk. Sometimes I look at their homework. And then, yeah, we talk about a lot of things. It is not the same, but at least they, they, they see their mom and they interact. So it is not easy. There will not be a perfect, a perfect thing. Always I say something has got to give. When, when you have to do something, you always have to sacrifice something. The question is, is what you're sacrificing worth it? What is the end game? If it's not worth it, then for me, don't bother. But if it is worth it, please go ahead and get all the support that you can. You, yeah, you are not a superwoman, you cannot do it all. So get support and, and enjoy your journey. Thank you, uh, Tabitha. That's, uh, that's, uh, that are very good uh, suggestions. Um, th there was another question, in, in, and it was a question in, in, in the, in the Q&A, but also one that I had myself. Can you also give some advice? Uh, you already gave them to, to the researchers, young researchers and female researchers, but perhaps also to the research uh, uh, institutes, uh, like, like uh, your home institute. Institute, but also to, uh, to ITM, what we can do as an institute to perhaps better support uh, researchers in general and, and more specifically uh, female researchers and what we can do better in terms of uh, gender equity and, and diversity actions. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So for me, the question is in two parts, the gender part and then the diversity part. So gender, men, women, and everything. One, I think that for institutions, especially ITM or my home institution, um, there must be a committee or an office dedicated or whose main task is on gender uh, equity. And so maybe ITM can have center of gender equity, right? And their main task is supporting counseling women about opportunities and um, career paths so they can so that that center or that committee can even have short courses or trainings on core career skills assertiveness in women because especially in sub-saharan africa we are not trained to be assertive um, as, as women to be able to speak up to be able to negotiate even for wages so you can see wage disparities between men and women doing, performing the same task. Public speaking, and even the ITM selection committees or the selection committees in our, our institutions must be gender, gender balanced. So sometimes you see all men panel and sometimes, sometimes you see an all men, all men panel and yeah, there must be a conscious effort to have women on board. And um, in terms of the setting, 
for example, in ITM, when I was there, I never saw a place that mothers can, can give breast milk to their children when they come to work. Maybe there's one that I didn't see. But these are some of the small things that um, institutions like ITM can put in place. And for students who are mothers, maybe a special stipend or the courses that are offered, flexible options um, for mothers. So if it can be done for in two years, maybe they can do it in two years and have the opportunity to go home, back, back to their home country and come back depending on their, on their, um, their situation. Also financial supports. Um, so it may not be big financial support for congresses, workshops, just to motivate women to take um, a career path in, in science and research. And then there's the diversity part. So there's the gender part and then there's the diversity part. The diversity part um, we're looking at, so I looked at the fees that people from low resource setting pay or from other countries who are not um, Euro, non-Europeans pay. So if you don't get the scholarship, think the payment is three times. So if you are non-European, it's three times. So, I mean, for somebody who didn't get a scholarship, it will be very difficult. At least, the least that institutions like ITM can do is to make the payments the same, especially for people who didn't get the scholarship. Just to encourage um, um, people from diverse backgrounds to be able to apply for these, um, for these studies. And then also maybe the last part, the, the other, we can write and probably write a whole thesis on this, but the, the last part will be, uh, I see that ITM usually likes people with experience and it takes a while to, to build the experience, right? So by the time some of us finished medical school, we're on the wrong side of, of, of 20 and it takes a while to build that experience. So by the time people build the experience, they're already in their mid thirties, where in Europe, yeah, people in their mid thirties, most of the time have their PhDs already, but it's not the same. So maybe, help for people from low income setting, first generation students on guidance and a swift path, especially if you see talent. Eh? So it's not open for all. It's people really with talent and, and, and prospect to be able to um, push them to, to the site that they have to be. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts. And I think that our action plan is now almost uh, written by your suggestion. So thank you very much. So it was also a question in, in uh, the chat on Astrobody congratulated you on being a pioneer of uh, science in your uh, family uh, and asked uh, how did you manage uh, to go against the tide and, and to become who you are. And uh, in addition, another question in, in uh, the Q&A was, were there ever moments that you thought of uh, uh, giving it up or that, uh, yeah, that the challenge was perhaps too, too, too big? And yeah, apparently you're still uh, uh, here and, and pursuing for your PhD. So how did you overcome the difficult uh, uh, moments or uh, moments of uh, crises? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Um, so the first question, if, if I get, uh, is the, being the pioneer in my family, and then if I will be able to cover all areas. <sighs> Definitely, it will, be, um, it will be difficult to cover all areas. I mean, like I said, there is, there is a balance, and usually something has got to give. But I say that I really have uh, family support, so support um, for, for, for taking care of the children while I'm away. And yeah, there's been times when I have thought of stopping. They are, and sometimes the challenges come from women, <laughs> not men. So before I traveled outside, I actually, so I'm sharing it on a webinar. I actually had somebody literally telling me I'm a bad mother. 
for, for, for leaving my children to pursue further education. But um, I'm thankful to all the people who are around me. So it means, it means it's very important to surround yourself with people who will encourage you. Sometimes, sometimes I don't see the, the talent. It's like, what are these people seeing that I cannot see? <laughs> like they see something that I cannot see. And all these people give me the support, give me the, the, the push that it is doable, that even if I fail, I will not be the first person. And I must say here today, um, so Dr. Dr. Day, you're here, my first specialist exam, I failed it. I failed it and I almost stopped. And then my boss told me, yeah, you're not the first person who has failed an exam. And that was my first failure in, yeah, I've never failed any exam, any major exam. And then I first failed my specialist exam. And I said, let me know, let me stop this. And she said, you can do it, you can do it. So just the, the push, the support, surround yourself with people who are like-minded and you will be fine. Thank you. Thank you. So, so there was a, one specific, so we, we already addressed some questions as, as um, let's say, is it more difficult for female researchers than, than for male uh, researchers? And one of the questions is, um, did you encounter specific challenges, you being an, an African woman in uh, science? Did that make an additional difference or was it an additional challenge or perhaps also an opportunity? I don't know. Can you elaborate on, 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 on that? And thank you. I think I, I, I can say that I have faced challenges, but I have a particular way of looking at things. I see every challenge as an opportunity. So I have been told a number of times that I'm, I talk too much, <laughs> that sometimes I have to keep quiet for the men to talk <laughs> and, not, and not leave. Like, yeah. But I usually close my, my eyes to, to these things. And what also helps me, sometimes also you meet people, you have your credentials, and their first thinking is that, sorry to say this, you had to sleep with a man to get there. So that's a very big challenge, like going around, working hard, and it's like you have to work extra hard to prove yourself that you really deserve to be uh, at the table. But I must um, say I am happy that I chose right, my local mentor, because she has, so that's Prof. Bria Boa, she has, she has been through it all. So when I have such challenges, I speak to her and it uh, again signifies the importance of having a mentor that you can speak to. So a, a mentor who can who can be a friend. So speak to her and then she tells you, okay, this, when I found it, this is what I did. So you maybe you don't do it this way, you do it that way, mellow a bit. And then um, we, we go on as it comes. But like I said, I see every challenge as an opportunity. So use the opportunity to change the, the status quo. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tabitha. Um, I, um, in, in a minute, I will pass the floor to, to, to Ludlana because I see that there are some more content related uh, questions uh, as well, but I, I will uh, ask you just uh, uh, one more. So in, in the Q&A, there was also a question, uh, congratulations on the great presentation that a lot of people uh, say, but also your experience here in, in uh, Antwerp or in ITM uh, Antwerp, did that uh, uh, also influence your medical practice in, uh, in Ghana? And in what, uh, if yes, in what, uh, in what way? Yeah, um, thank you very much. So at, in, in Belgium and at ITM, with all the interactions with the experts that um, I, I, I met and the work, so I see that in ITM, especially people mentor. So you can easily, I can, you can easily walk to Lut and speak to Lut. You can easily go to Itzy 
And that is something that is um, lacking what I saw back home. The easy interactions between students and their teachers. And that is something that I have started implementing in my own practice with my own students and my own interns. The ability for them to be able to come speak to me freely about everything and talk to me about um, anything, about, about um, the clinical work and then the practice. Also, um, there are meetings, so meetings to talk about clinical research issues, um, uh, challenges with cases, and that has also influenced um, my practice. And another thing is the teamwork. Um, the teamwork is really good, especially with the HIV TB units at ITM. There's a lot of a lot of teamwork with the seniors and the juniors, and then so you see the seniors are, are mentoring, actively mentoring and interacting when they have um, like likened research interests, and that also is um, influencing how how my practice is going or since I came back this year, how my practice is going in, in the country. And hopefully um, we can do more in shaping up, up the narrative in Ghana and in Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole. Uh, thank you, uh, Tabitha. Perhaps one more question before I pass to, to Luther. Uh, a uh, uh, nice question also in the Q&A. So uh, the person uh, asks, okay, why, why did you choose to be a scientist? Uh, because indeed the challenges are, are there, uh, resource-related uh, context, low pay, um, uh, sometimes uh, very yeah, hard working uh, conditions, and there are better paid uh, jobs like, uh, for instance, perhaps in business and in uh, law. Uh, so why, why science? Thanks. I think it, it goes back to why doctor first and then why research and why infectious disease research. First, why doctor? Remember I said that my, I was the first in my family to go to high school. What I did in art was that my father fell ill when I was eight years. So he has actually been bedridden for more than 25 years. He's still alive though. And so that, um, that pushed me that I have to be able to get to a point where I can help people. So for me, I see medicine as when people come to us, they come to us in their lowest of moments. You never see anybody in the hospital who is really well. So people come to you when they need help, just like my father did. So that was what pushed me to become a doctor. That is one. And then when I started, uh, I came to my current station, I saw that even though we are in Sub-Saharan Africa, we are in Ghana, we see a lot of infectious diseases, the expertise itself to manage, so the case management itself is lack. For me, at that time, it was lacking. So yeah, people see TB and the management is all over the place. People see HIV and if it is not the program um, drugs that are supposed to just be written, the management is all over the place. So really the clinical management of the complete patient that is in front of you, presenting with different clinical conditions and different comorbidities and how to manage it, taking the clinical decision. The other side of it is from my very poor background, I saw that infectious diseases was disproportionately affecting people who are poor, people who cannot pay. And so I decided I am going to help people who cannot pay. So I decided to stay in infectious diseases. So really it gives me the energy <laughs> to be able to get up and go to work, just to be able, able to help people who cannot pay you back um, in terms of money or anything else. So you, I do it and I know I'm not going to get anything from it. 
The other side of it is, yeah, we have these, we've been doing, so that's the other side that sent me into research. We've been managing tuberculosis, we've been managing HIV, we've been managing all the infections, but the outcome are not really different. Then I start asking myself, why are the outcomes not different? Why is it that we haven't been able to eradicate malaria all these years in Sub-Saharan Africa, apart from the, the climatic conditions and all that? Few years ago, a few decades ago, malaria was endemic in, in, in some parts of Europe, but it's no more there. Few years ago, tuberculosis, HIV, they were all endemic, but why is it not there? What can we do differently? And that brings the, the research aspect. So I don't want to lose either. So I don't want to lose the part of being a doctor and helping. And I also don't want to lose the part of answering the question why. So I decided to add and do be a clinical researcher. Thank you. Very inspiring, uh, uh, Tabitha. I pass the floor to Lutu now for asking a question on the content. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, uh, Tabitha, I think you should do your PhD on being a woman in science. There's a lot of interest in that topic. Um, there is one question in the forum um, from uh, Matthias Fouten. Do you have any sort of in, interesting presentation? Do you have any um, data from other regions uh, in the world on TB and NTM co-infection? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Max, for, for... Sorry, I don't hear you now. Can you hear me now? Um, do... Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Oh, it's okay um, again, yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, so um, I said thanks, Matt, for the question. Um, so yes, to, to straight to the question, there was a recent paper, and um, then I would have to pull up that paper from, from Asia that presents the co-infection. Um, so TB, NTM co-infection, but like you know, Matt, it is difficult to say NTM PD in the presence of other um, um, conditions, right? So if there is another infectious disease like TB, you cannot really say NTM PD. What you can say is that there is a co-infection and whether the NTM affects the outcome. And for the strategy in, in, di in diagnosing the co-infection, um, especially given the, the, the difficulties like we, you know, what we plan to do is to take all the people who present with presumed TB. So in, in Ghana, in, in many resource limited setting, we have the screening tool that we use to screen people for, um, for TB. So if people, have presumed TB, we're going to take their samples first for expect and smear, so both at the same time. Now, for us to know co-infection, then it means that the person has to be positive for both expect and the smear, because the expect will be positive and the smear will be positive. It's possible that it is the TB that is giving the smear positive. It is also possible that it's not the TB that is giving the smear positive. And also we are going to take the people who are expect negative and smear positive because most of those who, who have NTMPD will also have smear positive. So on that, um, then after we take that cohort of expect positive, smear positive, and expect negative, smear positive, we're going to do culture for them. So culture using the magic. So that culture using the magic will tell us, so if, if there is co-infection, those with expert positive smear positive will also have NTM are being isolated. And then those with expect um, negative smear positive will have NTM isolated. But again, remember that smear positivity does not necessarily mean NTM, right? Because it can also be other um, um, acephas bacilli, like, you know, bonocardia and all the other species, or even dead mycobacteria. Um, so if, if it's uh, another mycobacteria is present, they will grow on the midget and then we'll go ahead and subtype. So definitely it is going to be challenging in differentiating colonization versus disease. 
and that is where the um, the ATS criteria comes in comes in handy, where we are going to use to to characterize whether the patients have NTMPD or not. And then after even characterizing, then the next thing is deciding on treatment because not like you know, not everybody who is diagnosed of NTMPD or co-infection will, will, will need or will require treatment. And that is where the experts will come in. So we we'll have an expert group that will decide on treatment. And ultimately after the after the four years and maybe over, we can have a shorter path, right? So not going through all the long path because we don't have the CT scans readily available, how we can use x-rays to, to um, uh, reduce that path, how we can use other pathways and not only culture to diagnose NTMDD. So it is going to be a challenging path. I can, I can, I can, we can foresee that it's going to be challenging, but that, that's also what makes it interesting. The challenge makes it interesting to know what it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabita. I think Matt is happy with the answer. I, I, I would be. So, um, <laughs> I wanted to give the floor back now to Charlotte because we have come almost at the end of this webinar. Uh, thank you from my side. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity, Charlotte, and all the ITM um, community. Well, it is up to me also to thank you very much, Tabitha, for uh, presenting and sharing uh, your first uh, research findings and also your insights and uh, challenges and experiences as a woman in science. Also, thank you to Luther and Anne for uh, the interactive and enriching moderation of the webinar. Also, thanks to Eve for the technical support and the assistance. Uh, of course, also thanks to the participants uh, from around the globe for attending the, the webinar. Thank you also for taking time to, uh, to complete the short survey, which will be displayed shortly after. And we hope to see you back at one of our upcoming uh, ITM alumni webinars. In the meantime, stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much.